Hi, I'm Jasper Pattenden at Wickham Wanderers, and you're listening to Wickham Sound. The Wickham Wanderers Show. Welcome to this week's edition of the Wickham Wanderers Show. We kick off this week with some highlights from last week's game. Not really, there wasn't a game. Uh, but we will be chatting to uh, Phil, uh, who'll be bringing us a preview of the game, which is upcoming. Uh, that, of course, is the visit of Blackpool on Saturday. Uh, Phil will be accompanied in the uh, Bill Turnbull gantry by Steve Brown. Very much looking forward to that. He'll. Sorry? Ooh. Is it haunted? No. It's an exciting ooh. Oh, I see, sorry. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> ooh. It's not a game show. And. <laughs> He'll be in the Legends Lounge as well. Uh, Steve Brown, not Luke, making that noise. Uh, maybe. Maybe that too. Uh, also, on this week's show, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Matt Cecil, who um, will be looking ahead to the March for Men in Age of Prostate Cancer UK in memory of the aforementioned Bill Turnbull as well. Uh, around 300 Wickham fans, plus some uh, big names from the game, led by Jeff Stelling, of course, will be marching from Wembley to Wickham on Sunday. It's a 26.2 marathon course and uh, raising money for uh, a fantastic... Uh, cause as well and as I say in, in memory of Bill we'll be looking at to that very soon we'll get the thoughts and memories of Alan Mays a striker who played for Wickham like, just for the one season between 87 and 88 also made his name turning up for the likes of uh, Watford and Chelsea and Blackpool coincidentally too uh, we'll chat to a new Wickham Wanderers women signing I've missed someone out I'm coming back to them I'm doing it in order that it's going to be on uh, we we'll chat to a new Wickham Wanderers women signing Julia Livy will be joining us uh, she's a striker slash winger and also Kieran Sandlier we'll be hearing from him as well I spoke to him up at the training ground a little earlier on and last but of course by no means least on towards the end of the show to make you listen all the way through is the manager Matt Bluefield no it's normally on at the end because we often hear from him with Phil as well but yeah, yeah, yeah. no honestly uh, that's all to come in the next hour but first as mentioned uh, a bit of a chat with Phil to find out uh, what he uh, and the team have been up to uh, during their uh, well not week off that's, that's wrong to say that isn't it uh, but uh, international break without any football yeah it was weird last Saturday not having a game uh, it's nice actually to spend some time with the family though I should put that in but yeah coming off the back of, of two away wins in the league um, it's good to be getting back hopefully to pick up on that decent form but Equally, it's a challenge for Blackpool because they won their final game before the international break with an injury time winner. So you could sense that their momentum possibly that they wanted to continue as well. But such is the way of football now. We had to have that week off. But yeah, it's been interesting hearing from the gaffer as well, thinking about how they've been using that time up at the training ground because obviously three of the lads have been away, but the rest of them have been up here and a great opportunity for them to do some work away from a match day but with match days to reference so it's not like a normal pre-season so hopefully they found it very useful they had their behind the closed doors game which again it's really useful to have that, that sort of that sort of way to, to work on things and to, to look at certain players too yeah yeah I mean seeing the clip from uh, on Twitter of the goal I think it was last kick of the game brilliant brilliant free kick from Kean Brecken uh, so hopefully he can uh, he can take confidence from that as well as as uh, with all the other players who got minutes in that game uh, against what sounded like a very competitive absolute side who've been doing very well uh, in the last couple of years too, so so yeah, it just adds to, you know to the into the excitement really of this Saturday's game against Blackpool. And as you touched on, they're a team who had quite a similar sort of start to the season. Yeah, they've not been scoring a lot of goals. Uh, they've not been letting many in either. I think out of the six league games, they've had three nil nils. But they do have Jordan Rhodes up front, who I know many Wickham fans will shudder at the sound of his name because I think he he loves a goal against Wickham Wanderers. Uh, I think it's eight in. I can't remember how many games he's played, but it's it's a lot of goals against Wickham. Um, and he scored for Blackpool last time out as well in the fourth minute against Wigan. Um, so, yeah, someone that Wickham fans would be very worried about, no doubt. And also a, a really nice, picking up that momentum, which which was, you felt was starting to build and things were starting to click. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, the two away games, two excellent results, you know. Northampton and Bristol Rovers, uh, I thought Northampton were certainly in the first half one of the best teams I've seen this season in terms of their the way they played and their possession without the cutting edge from a Wickham point of view, which was very handy to see. But yeah, it would be lovely to get that three points on a Saturday at Adams Park. Um, hopefully a decent crowd there to see it too and, and continue to build. Um, and then straight off the back of it, we're into the, uh, uh, the Papa John's Trophy Games on the Tuesday as well. Because, of course, um, people would have listened to Ring in the Blues and heard that Joe Jacobson's on it, had a bit of a setback to his recovery. But I guess this, this sort of period is really nice for those to, to kind of get back as well in terms of receiving treatment or just recovering. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, none of the players want to be injured or like being injured, but um, they're not missing out on match days when, it, when it's down to this. But obviously, you know, the hard work that the injured players put in here, I mean, we're based up at the training ground full time now and we get to see how hard they have to work. And we also get to see their sad faces looking out the window 
when their teammates and contemporaries are out there on the training ground uh, and that's where they want to be so um, but you know the work of the medical side here is you know is exceptional and you know they come back hopefully fit than they were before and a nice treat for you a birthday treat on Saturday they'll have Steve Brown alongside you yeah yeah it'd be awesome to see Brownie um, what a legend you know I mean I remember him as a player that's how old I am <laughs> another year older on Saturday thanks for reminding me but I remember him in his 10 years for Wickham Wanderers one of my absolute favourites you know what a player he was um, you know not just for the yellow cards and the red cards but you know he was just fantastic to watch for Wickham Wanderers uh, a real uh, wonderful left foot as well scored some fantastic goals um, but a real leader as well and um, you know it's no surprise to know that he's still in the game so looking forward to catching up with Brownie uh, in the Legends Lounge and also he's joining us in commentary so it'd be brilliant to get his thoughts on the game I can't believe it it's a year since we did our first game back up on the Bill Turnbull Gantry and, uh, and the first game up there was against Action Stanley on a Tuesday night and Brownie was the, um, the co-coms that night so um, yeah it's quite a good way to mark a year and also, of course, you mentioned, Bill, a fantastic event on, on uh, Sunday, which you'll be involved with as well. Yes, I'm doing the walk um, with 400 or so other people. Uh, Jeff Stelling leading it, um, so looking forward to that. Um, yeah, we'll be recording all sorts uh, of stuff, uh, both live and recorded for, uh, for prosperity on that. That will be, be on Ring of the Blues next week uh, and on Wanderers TV as well. Um, so, yeah, it should be fantastic. Lots and lots of Wickham fans taking part too. Uh, you know, we all know the links um, with Prostate Cancer and Wickham Wanderers of Bill Turnbull. I just think what an amazing event. And I think it's Jeff's 34th um, March for Men, uh, which, again, great for, for effort from him. Uh, and uh, I've just been replaying our chat we had back in March when they launched it and making sure that everyone was going to be wearing shorts and comfortable shoes. Apparently shorts, no matter what the weather, if you're going to walk a long way, you have to wear shorts. So that's what I've taken from Jeff this week. <laughs> Nothing too long in terms of the trousers. Unbelievable, Colin. <laughs> And also, of course, you know, people doing it, uh, uh, everyone's sort of touched by uh, prostate cancer. And I guess it could be quite an emotional occasion too. Yes, yeah, uh, I think um, Bill's family will be represented as well, as well as the charity. Um, you know, and we mustn't forget that, you know, as much fun as it will be to see everybody and, and spend the day together, this is highlighting a, a very serious cause. Uh, and, you know, for men of a certain age, go and get checked, first and foremost. Uh, I'm not quite there. I thought, well, as, as you've already pointed out i'll be a year closer by sunday so maybe i will be entering that window very soon but you know regardless of the age regardless of, of your gender everyone should know about this because early detection is is the best way to deal with it and obviously quite nice as well for you to be able to reflect on your you know your time with bill as well and then the sort of the fun times you had yeah i mean we've just seen some photographs that um prostate cancer uh, I've got from, from Bill at Adams Park and with Wickham Wanderers and many of which I sneak into and yeah I mean I mean, I still miss him to this day especially doing the games together uh, and even when he couldn't get to games uh, those handy little text messages picking me up on, on my grammar uh, I miss those although I often think of, if I do slip into a bad habit I just give myself a little slap on the wrist now and I can picture Bill Stern face telling me off but such an amazing help for me um, especially when I was starting out so I still miss those occasions but every time I get up onto the gantry you look out at that view and you just think of Bill straight away because he loved it up there and when you get up there you can see why It's a really nice legacy for him isn't it the association with the club but also obviously the, the message that he's getting across about the charity too Yeah I mean it's incredible the, the, the stats you see of, uh, of a, the amount of people that are now getting themselves checked earlier and also the amount of people who are then subsequently getting finding out the, what is the bad news that they're, they're, they're testing positive for, for prostate cancer but also that they're getting it early enough for them so the treatment can really make a difference uh, and, and, and not have a terminal diagnosis which unfortunately as we know is what Bill had to go through so every life that is saved along, along those lines and, and countless number of lives have been saved uh, I can't think of a better legacy for anybody than that, really. Um, and Sunday will just be a great way to celebrate that, uh, to celebrate the memory of Bill, and, as I say, to keep raising awareness uh, to, to, to make sure there aren't many people following the road that Bill unfortunately ended up on. Uh, and, yeah, one day, hopefully, we'll be able to talk about a cure as well, and the money that's raised on Sunday can hopefully contribute towards that as well. Well, enjoy the game on Saturday and your, and your walk on Sunday. I'm hoping I'll have a spring in my step on Sunday as a result of Saturday. Could be a really good weekend, especially if lots of money is raised on Sunday following uh, all three points for the home team 
on uh, Saturday and possibly uh, a debut for uh, Kieran Sadley as well, who we'll be hearing from a bit later on. But we were talking about the uh, March when the Prostate Cancer UK uh, walk, which is taking place from Wembley to Wickham on Sunday. And uh, I've also been chatting to Matt Cecil, who of course is uh, head of media at the club and uh, can tell us a bit more. When we learned of Bill's diagnosis, what, six years ago, and, and obviously being close to Bill through that time and then the sad news that he died last year, you know, once the once the grief has and the mourning has kind of subsided, you get overcome with this feeling of wanting to do something, to remember him, to honour him, and and to help others avoid having to go through the same kind of you know, experiences that he and his family had to do. So I remember the really earlier conversations with the charity, and they said, "Look, we're, we're planning this walk Wembley to Wickham, and it's a logistical nightmare, um, but we'd love to make it happen. What do you think?" And I said straight away, "You'll have the backing of everyone at Wickham Wanderers." Um, what Bill meant to us, you know, what the charity has done for so many Wickham fans as well with the support and the advice and the expertise that they give. So I said, you know, tell us what we need to do and we'll make it happen. And, and from there, um, all the plans have been put in place. The charity have done an outstanding job. The Wickham fans have responded in their numbers. Uh, £175,000 have been raised so far, I think, which is incredible. And that will continue to go up, I think, over the weekend. Uh, celebrities taking part, a lot of media attention around it. And it's amazing that you know it's all going to culminate with this walk on Sunday and, and the sight of 350 people walking up Hillbottom Road or limping up Hillbottom Road or carrying each other up Hillbottom Road. Whatever it takes to get across that finish line, they're going to do it and we'll be so proud to see them finish. I'm really emotional, I'm sure, for people taking part who have you know, been touched by prostate cancer themselves. Absolutely. Everyone will have a different story. You know, I know... Uh, you know, my dad, very you know, personal to me, um, went through prostate cancer a couple of summers ago and I remember how I felt when he told us the news that his PSA levels were high. This was scary, new territory for him and for all of us. None of us really knew what it meant and thankfully for him he was able to go through radiotherapy. You know, it, it's life-changing, it really affects you, it, it affects physical and mental health. Um, and then, you know, there's my mum and my, my brothers that had to go through that kind of fear as well with it. And But to come out the other side and for him now to, to spread his legacy and tell other men that it's okay to talk about it, it's okay to, to feel to down about it and to fear for what's going to come. All the, the changes that your bodies are going to go through, um, you know, as a result of having this treatment, it's okay to talk about it. And we're going to... We're going to do this walk together. Um, you know, there's a Charlotte Cobb I know is doing it. Used to work for us, and, and she's got a very personal story to her as to why she wants to do this walk. We've got a lot of people around the club who have been touched by it, either personally or through people they know. And uh, I'm sure, you know, on that long, long walk, they're going to be sharing these stories. And, and why are you here today? Why are you doing this? And it's going to be amazing to see all those people bonding it and forming this community. And I said this to the charity the other day. Yes, it's about raising money, and yes, it's about awareness. But, but what it's done is it's built this community of people that have gone through it. And my dad, you know, is another example. He's been meeting up on training walks with other people that he didn't know, but they've signed up to go on these walks. And they've been doing tours of the Bucks countryside, getting in shape, talking to each other about their experiences and... And I think that's that's one of the most powerful things is the friendships and the communities that this event has, has created that will leave a legacy long after the walk is finished. They're going to be friendships for life. Um, more and more men are going to go and get tested of the, of the awareness. The charity is going to benefit from the money. And as I say, these friendships are going to be formed and the 300 walkers, hopefully they stay in touch. You know, Maybe we'll put on a little... Uh, reunion next year for them and they can come back and uh, and talk about what an amazing event it was and not just awareness but real understanding about prostate cancer as well has been has been heightened because of this yeah absolutely you know i'm i'm 35 nearly 36 actually uh, phil's having a birthday this weekend as well <laughs> should throw that in um but i had no idea really about prostate cancer until two or three years ago it was just something that old blokes get and you hope will never happen to you and you know my dad's an old bloke now and it, it happened to him but you know I've done the risk checker and I know that as someone, uh, you know, as the son of someone who's had prostate cancer, it makes me more likely to contract it in the future. And there, there's ages and there's ethnicities that will affect your risk as well. So, you know, that's a big key message as well from the charity. Go and get yourselves checked out on this online risk check. It was three questions, really, that will tell you what your next steps are. And unfortunately, if you tick the boxes in terms of age and, and it is more likely that, that black men will um, suffer from prostate cancer than white men and, and certainly with family history as well, you know, if you're considered high risk, the charity will tell you what you need to do. And if you act, you know, before it's too late, it's going to save your life. So, um, yeah, that, that awareness and all the education around it, you know, I think really was, was kicked off around Wickham Wanderers by Bill Turnbull, but it's being carried through by all the other men and everyone else involved that's saying, look, this, this is uh, you know, the biggest killer of men in the country, so let's tackle it before it's too late. And a really great advert, again, of how special football is, and especially this club is, in sort of bringing people together. Yeah, you know, I'm bizarrely looking forward to the walk more than I am, you know, the game against Blackpool on Saturday. The game against Blackpool on Saturday is one of 
I don't know how many games I've been to in my life, you know, and I'm always excited for match day and I love the thrill and buzz of a match day, but, but actually what Sunday means is in the bigger picture of life, it is more significant. Um, and it is through football that I got to meet and work with Bill Turnbull and it is through football that my dad's got to meet so many, you know, wonderful people around the club and, and all the people that are taking part, you know, fans um, coming together to do this march on Sunday is because they're part of the community that is Wickham Wanderers. So um, it is through the power of football that we all meet up and form these friendships but what football gives back to the society and communities is, is incredible and I think that's why we love the sport you know as well as all the action and the thrill of the drama on the pitch it's, it's what it does off for us off the pitch for us as well and what do you hope people feel and, and take from from the event on Sunday when, when they get to Adams Park um I hope they can get a good sit down <laughs> and somebody pours them a beer um more than anything you know I, I hope everyone can raise a glass and, and have a thought for Bill um you know this is being done in his name and in his memory um we think about him all the time we, we hear his voice so many times on old commentaries we see photos and it always brings a lump to the throat remembering him um Wembley standing up singing chair boys chair boys for 20 minutes knowing that our team needed encouragement and there's no one else there to give it to them all of the things that Bill did for this club the smiles that he brought to people's faces when he came through the room you know this this is this is being made possible because of him and his legacy so you know let's remember him on this day but for everyone taking part you know you should feel such immense pride and you know what some people might not finish it it is a long old way and for some people who have been through prostate cancer and their bodies have been affected they might find it too tough but it's, it's not about necessarily finishing it and doing a full 26 miles it's about pledging your support to do what you can to go the extra mile so to speak to raise money to raise awareness and just to be part of something so special so everyone taking part should feel so proud of of um what they've associated themselves to and i really hope you know they get the time to, to chat to each other to share experiences whether you're jeff stellan chris kamara you know the big celebrities or um you know your, your wickham fans who, who might feel too scared to go up and say hi to jeff and, and talk to him you know please do you are all in this together you're all equals doing this walk setting off at wembley at half past seven getting back to adams park in the evening um we're going to throw a party for you and applaud you all home it's a fantastic cause on sunday uh, matt cecil speaking to us here on wickham sound on the wickham wanderer show and uh, you can donate as well on uh, Saturday if you're going to the game against Blackpool uh, if you're not going to the game you'll hear uh, Phil commentating who will be uh, participating in the walk as well uh, well worth listening to this week's Ring in the Blues as well uh, and indeed next week's as well of course where you'll get uh, more reaction to that event the Wickham Wanderer Show continues here at Wickham Sound online on Radio Player and on 106.6 FM this is Wickham Sound Bill Turnbull a broadcasting legend whose tireless campaigning for prostate cancer awareness left a lasting legacy for men's health in the UK. Bill's message was clear. I really want you and your loved ones to take this simple online risk check now. Let's honour Bill's legacy together. Let's get men across the UK to check their risk. Let's broadcast it like Bill. Check your risk. Share the risk checker. Save lives. Still to come on this week's edition of the Wickham Wanderers show, we'll hear from manager Matt Bloomfield. We'll catch up with a new Wickham Wanderers women signing as well as a new arrival for the men. We've got the return of our notice board section. Hooray! Which was uh, so popular last week and uh, played such a pivotal part in the show as well. Uh, also last week you'll ho- know that uh, we heard from a former Watford player uh, who also uh, played for Wickham Wanderers as well, uh, Nick Price. Well, I believe I called Neil Price at one point, but um, hopefully that wasn't in the podcast version. Uh, no. Thank you. Uh, but big thanks to the Wickham Wanderers X Players Association because uh, we're speaking to someone else who uh, also played for Watford and Wickham and next week's opponent, this week's opponent's Blackpool as well. Uh, Alan Mays, who uh, still lives in the town and uh, has uh, very uh, early recollections of his time uh, at Lokes Park between 1987 and 1988. I knew I was going to finish at Blackpool and there was a chap called Laurie Craker who lived in Wickham who played with me at uh, Watford. I had a good career after that non-league and also managed, and uh, he knew Alan Gain. And I was keen to get into management and coaching. I'd done my two badges whilst I was playing professionally, and uh, the idea that was, having spoken to Alan Gain, that I would play the odd game for Wickham, bearing in mind the injury that I had, and finishing professionally, but I'd help help him with the coaching. And um, just before I drove down from Blackpool and finished my professional career and came home to Wickham because I kept my house here, I got the news that Alan Gain had been sacked. So 
it all went a bit pear-shaped from there. So do you have any sort of memories or, or recollections of particular games that you, that you did play or, or moments that stand out during your time at Lokes Park? To be honest, uh, Colin, not really. It's such a long time ago. I remember feeling that, oh, blimey, this is easy, without sounding arrogant. Um, it was a different level, obviously. I'd come from second division and then uh, Carlisle and um, then down to Blackpool in the third division. So I think we played someone like Maidstone at home and I scored in a, a friendly. I think that's the only real memory other than um, getting thumped at home by, I think it was Barnet on the sloping pitch. And that was... Uh, a bit of an eye opener, to be honest. The level was good. I, I wouldn't put it there, but some very good players there. That um, Mark West, I can remember, who was a decent finisher, and I think Keith Samuels was there. Neil Price, he came out of Watford. So you know, there was there was some good players, but we probably weren't the best team at the time. I don't think um, we were up there about uh, in terms of league position, but. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was uh, at least I was still playing. I, I was perhaps feeling the effects of finishing my career. I was 33, so I'd done quite well. But the osteoarthritis in my hip caused sort of other problems. But I was I was disappointed that I didn't play more games be- uh, and get involved in the coaching because I really feel that I could have made a much better contribution than I than I did. I mean, I ended up moving on and going into management non-league, and which in the end didn't suit me. And I started a, a career which I had to think about anyway, coming out of football. As someone once said to me, have you got a proper job? So <laughs> that um, was the situation. That, uh, but I, I lived in Wickham. Wickham are my second team, I have to say. So I wanted to make a contribution. It was just a shame the way it worked out with personalities and people that came in after Alan and um, I never really got a chance to work with him. So um, it was a very short spell. I did. I was grateful to the club that they manufactured um, a position of assistant commercial manager. Uh, I'd started to study before I finished football. So I was getting sort of good qualifications together, but um, that was a start commercially and a bit of a grounding, I suppose, towards, you know, later life, um, job recruitment, that sort of thing. And some other interesting times as well, obviously you've had dealings with, with Mike Keane, from another Wickham manager, of course, from, from your time at QPR as well. Yeah, huge respect for Mike Keane. Um, I, I could have gone to most clubs as a, school boy, so I had the pick of the bunch, uh, but I chose QPR. Uh, Mike had, wasn't there at that stage, but uh, he was manager of Watford when I left QPR. I, d- I didn't really get an opportunity there, despite really being in the first team at 17. It was I was 20 years old, and I got a note from Mike to go and meet with him, and he paid £8,000. I hadn't played a league game, but I made my debut for Watford at 20, which was a bit late in many ways. But he was a lovely guy, lived in Wickham. He, you know, he gave me the first opportunity. And you must be able to reflect so nicely on your on your career, you know, having played under people like Graham Taylor and, uh, and also even uh, Sir Jeff Hurst as well. Jeff Hurst bought me for, at uh, Chelsea. Um, I played under Bob Stokoe at Carlisle. And, um, yeah, Graham Taylor was a huge influence as, as much as I was disappointed that Mike left because everyone liked him. Um, that's when I really kicked on and started to score goals more regularly. And um, I was in the PFA team that year. We won the fourth division under Graham Taylor. And um, similarly, I got in the PFA team when I went to Swindon. So I start, started to score pretty regularly then but so uh, the big move came after a great spell at Swindon and um, it was Jeff Hurst that rang me up one evening and um, I thought it was a wind up but it, it was him and um, obviously he was an influence uh, given his reputation and 
I, I had the op- when I say I had the opportunity, I was told by the Swindon manager a few months before that Spurs had come in, uh, actually double the price, and he said you won't be going. But I think the board must have got wind of it, and uh, they needed the money, and I ended up going to Chelsea, who were a division down. So I, I'm a Spurs fan, Colin, so <laughs> I regret that. No, absolutely. But you must reflect so so nicely on on your career that you've had and the, the league appearances that you've made and the level that you played at as well. Yeah, I, I suppose I'll always reflect that I was so close to playing in the first division for a period. If I, if I had have gone to Spurs, who knows? But we were close with Chelsea to promotion. They got, as I say, then second division. But uh, I always scored one in three and... Uh, I hopefully did myself justice, tried to be a good pro. You know, I'd had a a good grounding, if you like, under Mike and Mike Keane and Graham Taylor, so always gave them my best. But um, the injury didn't help. I was about 29 and found I had a Chelsea at the time, and I found out I had osteoarthritis, which was going to be debilitating. And it was... <laughs> So that didn't help, and players didn't get the psychological help at that stage. Um, so it, it became more difficult, not not just physically, but also, I suppose, emotionally, when you've got an injury that's going to be progressive like that, and you lose a little bit of mobility and pace. But, yeah, I, I went on to uh, Carlisle and Blackpool and scored, um, at a decent rate again, but um, it was becoming more difficult physically because of, th- of that injury. And I suppose 33, I was pushing it a little bit, and it just gave out in many ways the the hip. And um, all of a sudden, I had to finish. And then Wickham Wanderers was the opportunity. It, it was great to be coming home to Wickham because we. We rented the house in, in Downley and um, we always intended to come back and settle, which is what we did. We've been here 40 years now. So, and um, Wickham was an opportunity at the time. I thought I was going to coach and manage, and I think I would have been a very good coach. I'm not sure about management, but uh, it didn't happen as a day. Different personalities came in and... I just regret that they didn't give me the opportunity to help. Again, I was from a different level. That's why like the scene is, I, I don't know, a threat. But I could have helped on the coaching and I could have played a bit longer. Not obviously 90 minutes, but um, I could have done a short stint and hopefully made a contribution from, from that point of view. But in the end, I had a good commercial career and um, I keep my eye on Wickham and hope they do well. But um, I I was born in North London, so I sort of always retain that uh, support for Spurs. But uh, I've been down to Wickham a couple of times last year and um, hopeful that they're going to do well this year. No, definitely. And I guess sort of mixed loyalties this weekend with, with Blackpool visiting as well and other of your former clubs. Well, I'd certainly want Wickham to win. Um, <laughs> it was quite a short spell. I had a great start at Blackpool. I, my debut was against my old side, Swindon, and we absolutely walloped them 6-2. Chris Kamara was playing for Swindon. Paul Stewart, who went on to play for Spurs in England, I played up front with, and I scored and had an assist. And then on the Saturday, I got a hat-trick. So on the back of that, I got... I was 32, I think I got a two-year contract, but it didn't pan out again because of the injury. But, uh, yeah, Blackpool was um, different <laughs> um, in terms of the location, playing in Carlisle. We we were always going to come home. So it was, it was difficult for my wife and a little girl of three at that stage. But um, in football, you've got to move on where you want it. It's as simple as that. Have you always been a striker as well? Because it must have been fantastic to, to get that, you know, the goal tally, like you say, the record of, what, of one in three. I, um, I think I scored 16. I got in the PFA team when Watford won the fourth division. 
But a season later, Luther Blissett came on the scene and Graham Taylor called me round his house and Swindon had bid 80000 for me and he said, I don't want you to go, but I want you to play wide. And that's a position that I think you'd excel in. But I'd always been a striker and I wanted to stay at Watford, so I gave it a go and um, it didn't work out. I went to Swindon. I scored 11 in 20, I think, the half season. We beat Watford at Swindon. And I got 28 the following year, and the country's leading scorer, bar Clive Allen of Spurs. And uh, Graham Taylor had um, sent a message to the Swindon manager that uh, if I scored 20 because I had a great start, he'd send me five pounds. Well, I had 20 at Christmas and was <laughs> the leading scorer in the country, and he sent me five pounds of pennies. <laughs> But despite the disappointment leaving Watford, huge respect for him and the contribution he made to my career and um, obviously went on to manage England. So, yeah, it was um, it was the right thing to do. You, again, as I said earlier, you, you have to move on. But some players come out of league football and have extensive careers non-league, like Laurie Craker, Wickham lad. He, he didn't play for Wickham, but He'd always lived in and around here, and he did very well non-league and also managed. And similarly, someone like Neil Price, who I know well from Watford, and Clive Walker at Chelsea had quite a long career, I think, non-league after playing professionally. I, I just wish I was fit enough to have, again, made a bigger contribution to my hometown club. Well, it's been fantastic to speak to you, and I think well, that's really nice about the, the ex-players association as well, and, and you know, fans listening who, who will have seen you play, and it's great for you as well as well to kind of be connected with with ex-teammates and, and people that you've played against as well. I think football is really special in that way. It's still a big part of my life, uh, Wickham Wanderers, in many ways, because I've, I've lived here so long. I've always kept an eye on you know how they're doing and been pleased when you know they've done really well. It's just a shame that the supporters didn't see the best of me, um, maybe for one or two games when I was fit enough to highlight what I could do. But um, as I say, I had to move on because of other personalities, which was a bit of a shame. But uh, it was still a great experience. And I was sort of grateful to the club that they gave me an opportunity commercially as well that set me on the road to bigger things. So. I'll always be a Wickham fan. Pleasure speaking to Alan Mays, who uh, played for the club as a striker between 87 and 88. And uh, do tune in next week for more from the Wickham Wanderers Ex-Players Association. Uh, let's turn our attention now to Wickham Wanderers women, though, who, uh, as you may have heard if you're listening to last week's show, on Sunday had their first home league game of the season. They've been catching up with uh, one of their newest signings as well, Julia Livy, uh, who has been uh, speaking to us about her football journey. I moved to England when I was 10 years old. And in Italy, football for women is not really popular at all, or at least it wasn't when I lived there. Especially in the part of Italy I was from, it's kind of like women really just mostly do dance or volleyball, stuff like that. So football really wasn't, you know, available. And I, to be fair, I wasn't even aware that I liked football at the time. But as um, I moved to England, I went into year six and I saw like all the boys playing in the playground and... I was like, you know, that looks fun. Like, I've always liked sport, to be fair. Just didn't know football would be my thing. But I joined in once or twice, and I actually really enjoyed it. And um, so, yeah, as soon as I then moved into year seven, I joined the women's football team at my high school, which actually happened to fold, like, halfway through year seven. So that didn't last very long. But then I met this girl. She actually played for the school team. She she told me that um, they were looking for some players that, this team called um, Colbert Royals. It's like a local team. And, um, yeah, I just joined them and started playing. I wasn't very serious at the time. I even happened to get injured, actually, and I needed surgery on my foot. But, um, yeah, and then, you know, just played a couple of seasons and then took it really seriously from there, I guess. So what was the process like for finding what would be your ideal position? Um, I always really started off as a forward. Like, I was never really a defensive sort of player 
But then my coach at the time was like, oh, you're never going to be a striker. Like, I wanted to be a striker, but he was like, yeah, you're never going to be a striker. It's just not, like, you're just not good at it. Like, it's just not going to work. But, um, you know, I feel like maybe that was just me not being good at football, like, at all, really, because I had just started and stuff. But, yeah, as I... So then once he said that, I kind of moved to playing as a winger. But every team I go to, they end up playing me striker or winger, but they really like me at striker. So I just kind of like, yeah, I just end up playing both, I guess. Is that so, quite nice as well? Because you've got that flexibility, you can do both. Yeah, and plus I'm both footed, so I can play on either wing. So, you know, I can cross with both feet and then cut in and shoot with both feet. So that's quite useful, actually. It sounds as well that you haven't found it too challenging, if you like, to be able to... to there haven't been not many opportunities for you to be able to play football because you, you hear a lot of uh, girls, especially, who, who found you know, opportunities quite restricted. I guess it's not that... I don't think it's restricted as much. I think it's more the opportunities we get are just not as great. Like, finding a team is not the problem. It's finding a good team that will kind of, you know, help you progress. Like, I think that's what the problem is. Like, you you can join a Sunday league team, but you play on, like, a minefield. You don't have the equipment. You don't have the right coaching. Like, up to when I was playing um, semi-professional for Leighton Orient first team, we had a parent or an unqualified coach as a coach. So it's you're playing for a professional team, but you're not getting the quality, you know? So I think it's more... I think what women talk about when we don't have the opportunities more for progression or like equal opportunities to men so like I feel like if you go to any academy of any professional team so like even under 16 they'll have like a fully qualified professional coach whereas us we'd be in the first team and we still don't get that same level that's what women are really talking about no it's a really good point and have you noticed the development of your own game as well um yeah, I've obviously um, since playing for like a couple of seasons now, I've definitely seen like major development. But I feel like most of that I've gained from when I used to play with boys. So I had some friends. We'd all go play football in these like astro pitches, and we'd just play football for hours on end. And I feel I feel like because um, they're obviously faster, stronger, I kind of just had to outskill them from not you know not being able to outspeed or outstrength them so I think that's improved me um you know majorly and plus I feel like their game is just completely different it's so much faster so much more technical so much much a smarter game again from I'm guessing from the better coaching they've had like since they were little I think it just makes a major difference but yeah that's that's kind of how I've improved um throughout really and have there been particular parts of your game that you've especially been working on, you know, especially recently? Um, at training, we've been working on um, finishing. And, you know, I think with me, because I switch from wing to striker a lot, because obviously you, you could do completely different things. Like, you're both attacking, but it's different on how, like, you pass the ball, how you run off the ball. So it's kind of getting used to that switch. And, um, but yeah, mostly, like, decision-making in general. I think that's a big part of football for everybody, really. No, absolutely. And tell us a bit about how your move to Wickham Wanderers Women came about. Um, actually, funny enough, I went to trial for them in January because my old team folded. And I did get in. Um, Carl offered me to sign in January. But the problem was that they only had like two, three games left. And I was really looking for game time. So then um, I ended up joining for Wimbledon under 23s because they had like 11 games left. So after the season ended, I was like, you know what? Um, I really liked it at Wickham, even though I only went for one session. Let me see if, you know, it's still still really nice. And, you know, the girls are lovely like they were in January. And it happened so that it was. So, yeah, just kind of decided to join again. And what have been your first impressions? I, I really like the setup at um, Wickham. It's very professional. You know, we have the video, we have the stats there. We have really good training with, you know, loads of um, coaching staff and, and everything. So I think, you know, I think there's a prom- promising future for Wickham. Um, I do think, you know, we're all working towards the same goal and 
I think it's going to happen at some point, hopefully this season, but if not, in one of the seasons to come. But yeah, I think there's a great future for, for Wickham. And great for you to be a part of that as well and be able to contribute, I guess. Yeah, I guess, yeah. It's, it's quite a privilege, to be fair, to be part of such a you know professional team. Even though we may not be in like a super high league, I think I think the mindset of being professional is is really key because you can aspire to be as as high as you want in the ranks, but if you don't have that professionalism, it's, I don't think you'll ever really be ready for for that. And what's been your assessment of the opening couple of games? I think we still have a lot of work to do as a team, but we have the talent and. Yeah, we just need to, you know, keep working together. There's a lot of new players this season and, you know, we just need to get used to um, working together, I guess. And it's going to take a couple of games to get into that. But our second game was already much better than our first. And, yeah, I think it's just uphill from here, really. And um, I think, we again, we're all working towards the same goal. So, it's, you know, it, I think it's going to happen if we all want it bad enough. No, definitely. It's fantastic and, and a great kind of community feeling amongst the team as well. And really great that you know, there's so much more interest in, in the team, obviously, I guess, in, in part because of the, the Lionesses' success, but also, you know, football fans generally just wanting to, to back women's football locally. Yeah, no, that is lovely, to be fair. And you really notice it, um, like, even in public, like when you tell people that you play football, like, everybody's super interested now. And, you know, there's people coming to watch, that like, genuinely paying to come to watch, which is... You know, it's kind of um, strange, really. It's, it's a weird feeling. But, yeah, um, I love it. And it's, again, only uphill from here, I guess. No, definitely. And I guess it's a common question as well, but do you set yourself kind of personal or, or team goals that you hope to achieve this season? Yeah, so um, team-wise, I guess, is, you know, contributing to promotion because I guess that's what we're all working towards. And personally, I really want to get as high as possible in football by the time I'm 25. So I'm 20 right now and I have, I guess I have, you know, I guess five years to, you know, reach that goal. Obviously, ideally, WSL, like, you know, um, striving for the stars, I guess. But, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes and try and get as high as possible. Online, on Radio Player and on 106.6 FM, this is Wickham Sound. Still to come on the final part of this week's Wickham Wanderer show, we'll hear from manager Matt Bloomfield as he prepares for his 50th game in management, uh, which obviously includes the stint at Colchester, and uh, not just with us as well, but uh, we'll also look ahead to the uh, game against Blackpool on Saturday. We'll uh, talk more about the Prostate Cancer UK March for Men as well, uh, as uh, he gives us his thoughts on that event, and uh, also, of course, find out uh, what he and the team have been doing during the international break and how beneficial it's been for him. But first, also in that sort of window, if you like, but uh, post-transfer window, of course, uh, Kieran Sadlier arrived at the club and uh, we spoke to him a little earlier on, on his 29th birthday. Yeah, now obviously celebrating birthday, I'm getting a bit older, but I try and forget about it, but no, I'm joking. Um, no, it's been, it's been a good couple of weeks. Um, uh, really obviously delighted to sign here at Wickham and uh, it's been perfect really coming in the last two weeks we've just been pure like training uh, it's been like a I guess I think it's like a mini kind of pre-season trying to like put together things we're, we're working on and kind of showing me how we play and getting to know the lads and they've been they've been really good they've been really uh, welcoming and um, everyone has and it's been it's been really good it's been uh, I've settled in really well I've lived not far off just down the road so um, and the weather's been amazing as well which is a big change from what I'm used to up north but uh, yeah it's been good does it feel a bit more perhaps special in a way arriving outside the transfer window does it feel a bit more kind of uh, different uh, no to be honest it feels the same to be honest because it was only literally on deadline day that we uh, I agreed to leave Bolton uh, verbally agreeing to come here so um, I still had another year left at Bolton but I just felt it was better for me to move on and, and try something new and a new challenge and kind of like and try and play uh, more regularly um, obviously I played really regularly at Orient last, last season but um, nah yeah it, it's pretty much felt the same but um, it's been exciting it's been good obviously I moved to another part of the country back closer to where I'm from to be fair but um, no it's been it's been really exciting and also I guess it must be feel like you're arriving at a really exciting time as well with, with what's happening here yeah no the boys are in good form they've uh, was it t- 10 points I think from the last so many games and 
yeah, the boys are all in good spirits, and but they don't want to rest on that. Everyone wants to win more games, and we want to improve on things. And I think they can. We all feel that we, there's certain things to improve on, and it's a long, long season, and uh, we want to finish as hard as possible and try and try and make this season a real success. That's something really nice, especially for you personally, to be able to kind of contribute. Yeah, no, obviously I want to come here and make a positive impact, bring some of my attributes here, and and uh, and hopefully they flourish. And you know what I mean and just work with the lads and um, just work hard and just and just enjoy myself enjoy I think enjoying myself and enjoying football is the main thing I think if you do that then the rest kind of goes goes by itself it's just about coming here enjoying football enjoying playing and in, in, in more further up the pitch was what I'm used to and how I was brought up and I think like yeah I think just enjoy football and work hard and I want to really contribute and be a positive contribution to this this club and hopefully we can do really good things. And hopefully I get to make your debut this weekend, which will be really nice, especially being a home game and also against Blackpool and you know, a team who've obviously just come down from the Championship as well. Yeah, no, that's obviously up to the, the management staff and, and stuff. But no, like whenever I make my debut, I want to make a real good impact and... Um, and a good and a sign of things to come uh, this season hopefully and uh, I'm looking forward to it whenever that is I'm looking forward to it and a great opportunity for you to kind of show the fans what you can do as well yeah no I, I, I want to show the fans that I can be a real like kind of creative attacking threat and uh, composed on the ball and and um, and just and work hard I think if you work hard I think sometimes the rest of it comes into uh, goes into place and no I'm, I'm looking forward to getting out on the pitch at Adams Park and and trying to maybe exciting the fans and you know what I mean and, and being and yeah I'm looking forward to it and do you get the impression that League One will be especially competitive and, and quite tight this season yeah no obviously I've played in League One for a while uh, for different clubs and this year seems to be tighter there's no real clubs that look like they've run away with it as last year I think you obviously had Ipswich's switches and Plymouths who just didn't stop winning then yeah, Sheffield Wednesday were, they were just behind them decent and then obviously us at Bolton we were we were in and amongst it as well And but I think this year it's tighter there'll be a few surprise clubs I think obviously at the moment Port Vale were flying after their first game of the season and I think um, a few clubs are doing really well Oxford are up there and Bolton are up there and even though Wigan aren't up there because of their deduction they're, they're still like a, a good team and Blackpool are a good team as well so, um, so I think it's a real chance for us to concentrate on ourselves and you know what I mean you can do anything in a season like there's no limits to what anyone any team can do in a season and there's no reason why we can't be one of those clubs that uh, in and amongst it and go and have a real success Pleasure chatting to you Kieran especially on his 29th birthday I'm sure he's celebrating as we speak Happy birthday Thank you uh, Also on the <laughs> <laughs> on the pebbles at the training ground, uh, sat down with manager Matt Bloomfield to uh, firstly find out what he and the team uh, were doing over the international break. Mainly on the training ground, um, we figured that um, it was uh, an, uh, an ideal opportunity for us to um, get some work in. Um, you know, we, we had a disjointed pre-season, so we felt that we could have a, a really tough few days with the boys, so we spent it on the training ground. It was... Um, it's been really nice to also have a little bit of thinking time without any games to prepare for to, to zoom out a little bit and have an overall view of what we've done so far, where we want to improve, where we need to get better and try and implement as much as we can. So it's been a really busy period for us, but it's also been nice to you know, have a little bit of thinking time on top of that as well. And obviously I'll be hoping that this weekend you can kind of resume the momentum that you're starting before the break. Yeah, yeah, most certainly so. We need we need to build on the two results that we had, you know, the two away games that we had that we were really pleased with the results. We've had a, you know, obviously a, a nice little run of games where we were pleased with the results, but we have to be temper that contentment with the desire to continually improve. You know what we're like, we're, we have our eyes firmly focused and fixed on the performance and that's what we're going after again on Saturday against Blackpool. And if we can do that, do that well, then hopefully the result will follow. And it's been, I guess, nice for you to have that extra preparation time as well. Yeah, you know, we've obviously had a, you know, a couple of injuries hanging around, so boys have missed that time on the grass with internationals away. So there always comes with a tagline that so nothing's ever perfect, but we understand that we have to be adaptable. But we've had plenty of time to work, and we we hope to put that into into action on Saturday. And boosted by a couple of arrivals since the, the break as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, you know. Sads with, has been known to us here at the football club for a number of years. We've been interested in, in him for a number of years, uh, and that 
was an opportunity that presented itself um, late on the Friday evening on the transfer deadline day. So we were really pleased about getting Sads uh, in the building and, and Franco as well, someone who couldn't come more highly recommended than he has done through Russell and, and Sergio. And I've just said upstairs, any friend of Sergio is a friend of Wickham Wanderers. So um, he's uh, it's nice to have another Argentinian in the building and with a bit of Sergio's character. And yeah, so he, he's a he's a very good goalkeeper. Um, obviously done the levels at Eastbourne before he went to Milton Keynes. And we're really pleased to have him to give Max some, some good competition and to add to our goalkeeping unit. And obviously on Saturday you're coming up against a team who you know, you've had quite a similar start to the season but until very recently not had a great record against them. No, um, yeah I think that you know these games will always come with uh, the history but also in isolation you know it's um, a group that we've put together that we're really proud about of, of how we've been able to put this group together and it's, it's a group that's we hope is evolving and, and getting um, together as quickly as possible so yeah it'll be a really tough game Blackpool got I think they've made some fantastic signings over the summer to go with the players that they already had. A really competitive squad. Neil Critchley's obviously a guy with immense experience, um, so we know we're going to have a, a really, really tough game. But we're also um, yeah, really confident in ourselves and, and we want to make sure that we, we go out and put on a good performance. And does it not really matter in a way that you're facing a team who's you know, come down from the Championship or indeed you know, coming up from, from League Two or, or whether it's an established League One side, really? No, I think every game is in with that isolation. I think early season maybe it's slightly different because the the teams that come up um, from League Two do have a bit, you know, a bit of momentum and a little bit, um, you know, confidence within their squad. But you know, I think if you look at Blackpool's squad, the way they've recruited over the summer, they've gone and been able to, you know, some, recruit some some really really good players. If you look at um, Jordan Rhodes, Albie Morgan, um, Carl Joseph, you know, they've already got some real good players. Shane Lavery. Uh, Obviously, Norburn as well. They've got some some real good players. Jensen, where they recruit, you know. So, you know, just trying to name a few that they've gone and done. They've got some good players. CJ Hammond is a good player. So we know that they'll come with threats. So we have to be aware of them, respect them, but we have to be confident in in, in our game plan and, and what we want to do. Uh, Interesting, in a way, as you say that um, Neil Critchley has, has been replaced uh, at QPR by Gareth, and then yourself obviously you replaced. It's, it seems a strange. Oh, sort absolutely, of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't realised that actually, but you're right. Yeah, putting it all together. Um, obviously, we know that the experience that, that Neil comes with, and uh, he's done you know an incredible job there once before, and is is now back. He's a he's a very good coach, um, and uh, you know organises his team extremely well. Got some good players there, so we know we're in for a tough afternoon. And this Saturday marks your your fiftieth game as a, as a manager. Is it something that you kind of? Uh, is it kind of? Does it felt like a natural progression really from being a you know, captain and coach and now manager as well? Um, maybe I, I think it's always some, it's something that I always had a, a big desire to do. Um, I've always really enjoyed responsibility with you know in my life. Um, I love being a captain. I love being a coach. I love being a, a dad and a teammate. I think that with responsibility really brings out the best in me. I believe. Um, and so going on to be a head coach or manager was something that. I really wanted to do. Um, you know, the 50 games seems to have flown by. You know, um, it's gone really, really quickly uh, in an absolute blur. But I've learned so much along the way, and I just, you know, I have to just retain this real deep desire that I want to, you know, keep going, keep moving forward, keep trying to improve myself first and foremost. I've got loads that I need to get better at, and I, I need to keep doing that to to stay in the job here and hopefully provide a, a good future. And if you had to make a decision as to whether you know you'll be a tracksuit manager or a, or a your kind of touchline attire, have you put yeah, my store well, into that? Yeah, no, I think that. Uh, Obviously, I, was, I wore my tracksuit at Colchester, then I came here, and, and, and then I thought I'm, I'm, I'm spending too much time getting dressed up every game. I would need to be in my tracksuit, so I think that's probably a little bit more me, if I'm honest. And just finally, looking ahead to, to Sunday, obviously really important that you know Wickham is, is kind of plays its part in, in, the, in the march, and obviously to honour Bill as well. Yeah, absolutely. We just again discussed it with you know anything, any time that Bill's name comes up, it just brings a smile to our face because of the memories we have shared with him and, and, and the memories you have about him. Um, an incredible man. It's so f- fantastic that as a football club we're supporting the, the charity. Um, and yeah, uh, I just think it's great that we're trying to raise money for a really, really good cause and it, it, pro- it promises to be a, a great day. And just sort of typical of the club, really, to be associated with, as you say, a good cause. Yeah, really. I think that you know the football club has always stood for real strong morals um, and in my time that it's been, I've been here and I think that's probably got stronger and stronger as the years have gone on um, and you know this football club believes in people um, first and foremost we believe in supporting um, positive things um, for change or for charity and I think it's another sign of, of, of who we are and what we stand for here. And really important how it just shows how you know valuable the fans, the club's fans are, and especially to help kind of pass on Bill's message of going check too. Yeah, they're everything to us, our supporters. You know, I think if you go back to the time when we were, you know, fan owned, supported owned, and you know, you have to only have to look around the summer here when we had the volunteers up. Um, volunteering, painting the training ground, so we had a, a better environment and a, an improved environment to come back to pre-season. You go down the ground, and there's so many faces that 
you recognise, you know by name or you know by by just being interacting over the years. I just think that our supporters do everything. As, us as a football club, we don't have you know, the biggest ground or the biggest fan base or the biggest backing in terms of numbers over the football league or the, or the league we're in. Um, but we certainly have the, the most caring and the most passionate ones because these guys are there for us through thick and thin and I think they're, you know, they're everything to us as a football club. And just finally, what would be your message to supporters ahead of uh, Sunday? Uh, yeah, just I think just thank you for your support and for an incredible uh, a charity. Um, enjoy the day for everybody who's taking part and, and thanks for the support. And I just think that, you know, like I say, it's just another sign of what incredible people we have um, here involved at Wickham Wanderers. Thank you so much for listening this week. Brilliant to chat to uh, Matt Bloomfield as well. And uh, a message about the podcast. Yeah, if you're listening on the podcast, the link to donate for the March for Men is in the, the description of it. And a very brief notice board section about the pink kit. Uh, there's a pink kit. It looks beautiful. It might be my favourite. Max Triek will be wearing it on Saturday. It's it's amazing. And I believe it's going to be in the club shop on Saturday. If not, after. It will be there. Uh, Luke Cashman will be in the car park on Saturday. He will be there. Rob's not here. So Luke Cashman will be in the car park from 12 uh, with Nigel, Sally and Martin Hughes of the Coffee Lounge. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and there's uh, Ring in the Blues post-match reaction after the game when it finishes. It's whatever time. Make sure you don't miss that. There's lots happening. <laughs>